Welcome, everybody. This is Hugh Massey, the founder and chairman of DNA Behaviour International. And today I'm delighted to be hosting another identity conversation. And I've got Ted McLyman from the MyEpix Behavioural Solutions Group with me. And Ted and I have worked on human behaviour and the insurance and wealth manager industry for at least the last 10 years and, and have a very deep shared passion on how we can help uh, financial literacy in the United States. So welcome, Ted. Hugh, it's a pleasure to be here and you still look good after 10 years. So, so do you. I think it must be all the, uh, the, the triathlons that you're doing. And, and, and for me, the, the riding on the Peloton bike all helped. So we, we still continue to look very young. That's, that's the secret. So, Ted, why don't you uh, tell, tell our listeners a little bit more about your background, your life, and, and, and how, you know, you've evolved to this place of being, you know, being very passionate about human behavior and baked it into everything that you do. Yeah, uh, yeah. thanks so much. I'll, I'll try to do the infomercial as quickly as possible. But um, I grew up in an incredibly middle to lower middle class family in upstate New York, uh, you know, the oldest of five siblings and uh, got into college at Colgate University because I played football. And uh, my, my, my standing in the class was such that a lot of people got into law school because of my uh, cumulative GPA. And for that, I do apologize, but it did work out. Uh, if you're not familiar with upstate New York, it can be dark and wet and cold. So I, I wanted to go out and do some things and see the world. And the military seemed a way to do it. And if you're going to join the military, be a Marine. So I was commissioned the Marine Corps coming out of college. Uh, the Marine Corps had the foresight to send me to Hawaii, where I was introduced to primary colors, sun sunscreen, and sunglasses. And I said, <laughs> man, there's something else out here that I was not aware of. But the key point in Hawaii, which is a high cost area, and at the time, the military is not making a whole lot of money. And I was finding out that, number one, as a leader, I was in the business of building relationships and managing behavior. That is the entire secret of the Marine Corps. And I found the Marine Corps is exceptional at, at a culturalization, bringing folks together from very diverse backgrounds to come together for a common cause and, and truly behavior modification. But then I found things started falling apart with money. I had troops that were literally living on the beach because they couldn't afford to live anywhere in a tent. And, you know, it takes a young 18, 19 year old to really school up money, uh, screw up money and young officers. So we had a lot of problems. It was leading to domestic problems, substance abuse, uh, performance problems, you know, just went on and on and on. So that was my first introduction to people and money in a, an applied manner. My undergraduate degree in social relations and economics. And I'm going, oh, my gosh, this stuff kind of works. But it was a little was not quite like the textbook. And I taught GED and I taught high school when we were on float. I got to meet these kids. And what I'm found is a common denominator is we all came together for our own little herd, our, our, our own culture. And most were very surprised when I bumped into another culture that was very different, but very much the same. And the common denominator was a humanity of the, of the sameness of being human. And once we figured that out, it worked out real well. The other piece was nobody had a background in money. Most yeah. of it was the first time they had cash. And it's amazing what you can do with money when you don't care, don't know, and just spend it. And that's went from there. So I put in a letter to get out of the Marine Corps. It was turned down, but they sent me to graduate school, picked up my first graduate degree, and my payback was teaching academics at the Naval Academy. There I had the privilege of working with some very, very sharp young people. And I found it took really sharp young people to really screw up money. And it just went on and on. And we had a, we had a problem where, where young ensigns and lieutenants and, 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 and second lieutenants were losing their commissions because of money problems. Uh, did some other Marine Corps things, built the Marine Corps financial management program, uh, commanded the schoolhouse, came back from Desert Storm, ended up as an aide to the Secretary of the Navy for financial management. And there I found it takes the political class to have a spin on people and money like no other. <laughs> And it was amazing that, that to sit back as an aide, you're like wallpaper, you're on the wall and you watch the behavior and you watch the interactions. And it was just amazing to me how 
our innate biases were influencing key decision-making policy meetings, and then the cultural issues, and then the mindsets. And, and as a result, well, we have a multi-trillion dollar deficit and a few things like that. Um, so i be very candid. I, I went there excited, uh, became a skeptic and left a cynic. And uh, when I retired, opened up my first uh, financial management practice. I was an independent financial advisor. I had my own practice in Washington, D.C., uh, then moved it down to Augusta, Georgia there for a number of years, had a couple of successful practices. But then I started bumping around and I'm going, you know, the common or conventional wisdom I was being taught by the professionals and from my academic background wasn't jiving with reality. And it became very obvious to me about my second or third year as a private uh, financial advisor that my job was to manage behavior, not money. And as we led, started leading up to the 2008 meltdown, and for those of you that don't remember where that, what that was, it was ugly. It was a lot of very smart people doing some very dumb behavioral things, but from a human perspective, made a lot of sense, at least to them. And when it all came together, the nexus was the biggest financial meltdown we've seen in decades. And it was you know, we could point fingers all day long, but the consumers were making bad decisions, the policymakers, the enforcement people, the product people, and it all came together in that one time and things fell apart. And that's when I first started realizing that what I was doing as a financial advisor wasn't working because I was really there to sell product and service. And I was being judged by my book of business, which translated into fees, commissions, and services, which had very little reality to the needs of my clients. I also realized that what I was offering was now a quasi commodity. Everybody that came through that wanted me to offer their stuff, it was the same stuff in a different brochure. Or wait six months and somebody's gonna have something just like it. So I started talking to my clients from a behavioral perspective. At this time, I started questioning my economic background. I got involved in reading up on, on behavioral economics, behavioral finance, neuroeconomics. Um, I had a second master's degree that I got before I got out of the Marine Corps in performance technology, uh, performance technology, which is how to build systems that work for people based on behavior and, and how to make sure they are moving in the right direction. So this all came together. I wrote my first book, Money Makes Me Crazy, a prescription for, for uh, money sanity. And I, it was for my clients to make them understand that the way they're naturally wired as humans doesn't translate to make them good money people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in essence, the, the, the eons of evolution that got us to where we are as humans and kept us alive in the forest while we're crossing the savanna, trying to get something to eat, and not be lunch for somebody else in the process does not translate well into a modern economy. And fundamentally, we're wired to stay alive and pass on our genes. We're not real good at doing taxes, reading uh, the small print on a credit card statement, figuring out what a mortgage is, or to unravel the inner workings of a variable annuity. So if you think about it, our brains have been around for about 3 million years. Money's been around for about 25 to 3,500 years, we should be surprised we get money right, not when we get it wrong. Well, that got me really focused and more passionate about changing the dialogue on how we think and feel about money. And from an institutional perspective, our concept of financial literacy. Did a lot of speaking um, to different financial literacy groups. And I became very frustrated because everybody talked about uh, the conventional wisdom, which is if I give you another spreadsheet, if you just get an, another calculator, if you just have another tool, it's going to be okay. But nobody was talking about the front end, which is the behavioral piece. And, and I became very passionate about the idea that the, the financial success is about knowing yourself, managing your behavior, then your money. And I coined the phrase money temperament. I just call it money temperament. And, and about the same time, you and I started talking. And from talking with you, because you're doing some brilliant work at the institutional side, and I was very frustrated working at the institutional side. I call it death by vice president. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> you know, yeah, I, I understand that. Yep. You know, you, you work into a big firm and, and you're, you're one of two things to a senior executive vice president, a threat or an asset. <laughs> and they determine. But you're not ever going to get anything done top down. So I wanted to start focusing bottom up. I wanted to start talking about the average individual, the average advisor, the average agent about what they needed to do to change their focus on money and people. And about the same period of time, I, I ran into uh, Jeff Morris on LinkedIn, and he had we had similar passions. And Jeff was was kicking around with a thing called uh, uh, Smart Smart Spender, and that evolved into what we now have as Dream Smart Academy. And Jeff had a strong background in coaching and, and the social piece, and a bit of a background in uh, uh, debt correction and mortgage. And and he and I hit it off, and we we knew we had something, but didn't know where we we're going to go with it. You know, it's like somebody throws you a porcupine and you go, okay, now what? (laughs) And uh, we realized that we needed to come together, but to be candid, the economy wasn't ready for it. The industry wasn't ready for it from our perspective. Uh, We knew that we needed to come bottom up if we wanted to make it happen. And my goal, to be very candid, right up front was to have somebody walk into an advisor's office carrying one of my books and go, do you do this? And hopefully that advisor is smart enough to go, Sure, I've been with DNA behavior for years and I'm going, you're in good hands. But then I found after talking to you that there were not that many people out there doing what you were talking about either. So we had to find to come together. Uh, then about uh, about four or five years ago, Jay Alexander Martin, who was one of the founders of the FUBU Corporations, one of the most successful entrepreneurs in the United States, his buddy is Damon John from Shark Tank, read my first book and said, Ted, we got to get together. You got to help me with my money. And at that time, Jay was burning, burning through money at a sustained rate. Uh, he figures he squandered about $8 million. And getting to know Joe, uh, Jay, because he wanted traditional advice. And I said, Jay, I can't give you traditional advice. I've got to, we've got to focus on the behavioral piece because the rest of it will take care of itself. And I helped him discover his money temperament. And in my, my current book, Discover Your Money Temperament, which is a, uh, an outcome of the, the other books, I have a system there called the money behavior system. And, I, and I, it's basically on first determine your values, then how you think and feel about money and money temperament. Money knowledge is how you process information. Then you build your strategy and then your plan. So this is the front end that is missing in most programs. So I started talking to Jay and Jay was burning through eight to $10,000 a week clubbing. Uh, he bought a Ferrari over the weekend, didn't like it, took it back. Uh, 20% shelving fee. Uh, he has a great story about uh, winning like $60,000 in Vegas and went right across the street and bought a $100,000 watch because he's his mind. He only paid $40,000 for it. Um, and he <laughs> knew it wasn't working. So I was able to work with Jay and he finally said, Ted, we need to write a book. So he and I co-authored a book called Money Makes You Crazy, How I Squandered Millions, Building the the FUBU Empire, about his journey from average American conventional spender, entrepreneur, money to burn, to where he is today, where somebody, he went from a money mindset to a wealth mindset, and having situational awareness and understanding who he is and how he's wired behaviorally with money, and he's doing wonderfully. And now, uh, we've taken all the books and they've been uh, reintroduced. Uh, you know, this is the current book, Discover Your Money Temperament, A Common Sense Guide to Financial Security, which is now we're using with DreamSmart Academy. It's been picked up by uh, the UPI Loan Fund as their, their basis for their vision and mission statement for what we're calling now behavioral financial wellness. And that is a powerful term that covers a whole bunch of stuff that was been missing since I've been in the money business. Yeah, I, I think, well, firstly, thank you for that, Ted, because I, th- I think you've, you've provided a great perspective on money and, and your background to it, which really started when you were 18 years old, right. um, you know, being in the Marine Corps and seeing all the dysfunctional situations that existed there with, you know, people reasonably well paid and not a lot of places to go and spend the money on, but they still find uh, a way to do it. <laughs> they, they still found a, they still found a way to do it. And then all of the, the the life stories, you know, that that you've brought out. And I think, you know, what 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 we really understand here is that when people understand money, they start thinking about 
uh, financial products, how it's managed, the markets. If, if something goes wrong, they're, they're, they're blaming those types of areas, but really it's all about human behaviour because it's the human beings that, that at the end of the day drive markets, believe it or not. It's yep. human beings that lead these corporations and it's human beings that design all these products. So, so there's human behaviour and biases everywhere. And when we've talked, like, you know, like you've discovered and I've discovered when we talk about financial literacy, no one's really delved into the behavioural finance or the behavioural area of it. Right. Um, because, uh, you know, I think people have been scared to or don't know how to do that. And well, I yeah. I mean, it's only this, the whole field of behavioral finance has only been around since really the late seventies. Uh, Kahneman and Travinsky really got it going with prospect theory and he won a, they won a Nobel prize for it, but it's bumped around in academia for a while. And it's had kind of a cult following, but like everything else coming out of academia, it's academic. <laughs> and it takes a little while to filter down. And I can remember going to conferences and sales meetings where they'd bring in some PhD and he'd talk about behavioral economics and went right over the top of our heads. When in reality, everybody's doing this daily. I mean, everyone, you're using behavioral economics. It's just nothing more is, is, is the fact that we're not rational decision takers. We're but, emotional but think, decision takers. Yeah, I think the, the problem is that no, the academic, academic world is not made a practical. I think they've got as far as how they could uh, exploit it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> setting up uh, various fund management type products and, and organizations. But, but in terms of directly helping the consumer make better no. decisions and, 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 and business leaders actually make better decisions and even politicians, no one's helped them with that. And oh, yeah. Yeah. And there's also a, a healthy sense of arrogance with really smart people, which you and I deal with a lot, that, that, that this overconfidence bias and all knowing bias. And the assumption is because I'm good at this, I'm going to be good at that, which is not a direct correlation at all. But we're dealing with people. And in our culture, we don't teach people and we certainly don't teach money. Money is a subset of people. Money is a human invention. It's a cultural invention. It's a reflection of who we are, what we think of. It's to facilitate trade. I can't think of anything that is more emotional, more, cu more culturally anchored or human than money and the spending process. However, if you read Samuelson or a classical book in, in economics, it says we are all knowing, we have absolute information, we take decisions deliberately without all the static and whatever. Yeah, that's right. Go to a yard sale. Take a look at the car you drive. Yeah, I think that the, the traditional way of dealing with money has been through the rational world, but but really it's, it's, it's emotions. And money is a reflection of uh, emotions. It gets triggered when, when people's emotions get, get, uh, get, get triggered in some way. And, you know, yep. it, it's so... You know, it's a mirroring of human emotions. It's a mirroring of, of people. You know, at the end of the day, that is what, what money is. It's a mirroring of relationships. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and, 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 and so and, we've and got to get in do, touch with that side of it. Yeah, and what you do in your research, you're the first group I've worked with that puts it down at that level. I mean, I've done, there are 3,000 different behavioral assessment tools out there right now in one form or another. I think every graduate student who's working their PhD dissertation has an obligation to have a four panel window assessment tool that is all based on the same thing with different terms. Where what I love about what you're doing and why we're using it with, with DreamSmart Academy so aggressively is it truly goes in with a validated set of tools that gives a snapshot of what makes this person tick. And it doesn't know such a way that it's usable by anybody if you're open to the information <laughs> okay yeah i think you know just for our for our listeners benefit you know what what ted's getting at is that everybody that uh touches the dna systems you know when we're dealing with um behavioral finance and, and behavior of money completes a financial dna discovery uh ted mm -hmm. you, you you've done yours and you're an initiator right. style and i'm an initiator style although there's some differences. There's some differences between our two styles, but there's a lot of there's a lot of similarities right. as well. But 
and, and for anyone listening, you can go online at financialdna.com yeah. or dnabehavior.com and complete a financial DNA discovery for yourself. It just takes 10 or 12 minutes. But that's what we've done to make this practical. Uh, and, and, and I know it's very helpful to you guys at the Dream Smart Academy. Sure. In putting something concrete before people to show them this is, this is who you are and this is where you're at and how we think you're going to make decisions. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I spend so much of my time now coaching and consulting small firms and independent advisors. And I think the first thing we, we do, we best baseline who that individual is. And usually that's a different uncovering or a different realization than, than they've gotten up to that point because most everything else has been institutionalized. I don't know if anybody's done a Myers-Briggs assessment at, a, at an open conference and everybody walks around with a, for a week with their, 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 you know, their, their uh, Myers-Briggs assessment performance indicator on their name tag. And it says, I'm going to be the CEO because I'm a whatever, whatever, whatever. And that's where it goes. But the reality is, is how do you facilitate communications? How do you build teams? How do you work smarter? How do you work towards productivity, bringing together all these assets? Because most leaders non-consciously are building a cookie cutter, one size fits them organization or approach. And it's very difficult sometimes to sit back, particularly with smart, successful people and say, hey, you were lucky. Okay, you were really, really lucky. And if you want to take this to the next level, you need a different mindset. That's a tough feat for some people, but but I think you're leading the way here. And I know with our experience with DNA that we're 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 making people sit down and take a hard look. But it's not hard in the sense that it's it's threatening. It's it's like the analogy I use is when Wizard of Oz, the original movie, when Dorothy squashes the witch and walks out and goes from black and white to color. That's what it can do for you individually. That's what it can do for professionally, and that's what it can do for your organization if you're willing to open the door. Mm. Yeah, and, and Ted, you know, in terms of your your talents of bringing this to the industry, to whether it's to advisors, agents, and also to the consumer, you know, what do you, what do you see as your greatest gift in terms of uh, bringing behavioral finance forward, financial literacy in, 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 in the end of the day, helping the world get, get behaviorally smart. Yeah. I think my gift and my ability is keep it simple. You know, I learned this in the Marine Corps that we realized when I came in the Marine Corps, first commission, less than 10 or 15% of our young Marines were high school graduates. Reading was a problem. And we figured it out. We figured out how to do it through some very, very innovative programs. And the bottom line is, how do you get the information in so we can have the behavior we're looking for on the way out? How do we modify the outcome? So keeping it simple is really, really important. And I believe if you're going to make this happen, it has to be bottom up, not top down. So if, 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 if you're talking about keeping it simple, we're talking about keeping the behavior simple. Right. So, so taking something that's mysterious to a lot of people, because this is why it hasn't been conquered. If you think about it, that, you know, the human beings being out there for a long time, human behavior has been there since Pythagoras, you know, two and a half thousand, oh, yeah. four thousand before BC money has been there from around the same time. Yep. Nobody's conquered this. Yeah. And but, I think, but we're conquering it, right? Well, or can well, conquer it. Part of it is, is, is a shift. I believe in the retching theory of change, which means you're not going to have substantive change until things are so bad, somebody's going to retch. I mean, it is that simple. We're human. And, and, and I, to keep it simple, I don't get into neurology and brain biology. I can talk yeah. that as well as that one, but I keep it simple. You got a feeling brain and you got a thinking brain. You spend 95 to 99% of your time in your feeling brain. That's your primitive brain, your, your limbic system. It's emotional. We are emotional, emotional animals who think we are not thinking animals with emotion. That statement right there forces a schism between the traditional academic financial industry and the real world. We are emotional animals. It's emotions that keep us alive. It's emotions that make us human. It's emotions that evolved over thousands and thousands of years that got us to where we are. But it's also emotions that put that puts you in a position to buy a hundred thousand dollar automobile that doesn't fit your two hundred thousand dollar house. And and 
that's human. So what we have to do is step back. And again, my goal is to be the top bottom up feed to what you're doing. You've got some really smart people you work with and you're doing some amazing, amazing stuff. But to be very candid, there's some people out there that have never bought a book on fine, have not read a book since they got out of school. Let's, let's go back from there. I mean, the stats on reading and, and computer, I mean, uh, financial literacy are abysmal, absolutely abysmal. People don't understand how it works. So what I try to do is one, make it really, really simple. Three things. Our biology gets in the way. We're hardwired to stay alive, not work with money. Number two, our belief set and culture, which is established by mid-adolescent. How you think and feel about money is about the same way you did in middle school. So if you had a starter jacket, a mullet, and needed Jordans, you still think that, but you're buying something else. And the next piece is the, the, it, the rules of business and the economy are changing at warp speed. And this is all a very, very different dynamic. So to put this all together, I wanted to keep it incredibly simple. Number one, I ask, what is important about money to you? What is your value set? As an advisor, we never talked about this. We only talked about goals. Goals are stuff, house, car, college. But the reality is, what are your values? What's the value you set you have behind your money? It's not that you want a house it's you want a house, why, it's, it's what's important about a house to you. I want a place for my kids to go to a good school. What's important about a good school? I want my kid to have the start I didn't have. What's important about that? I don't want to come back and live in my basement. Oh, so if I can find you a house that's going to give you all those things and guarantee your kids are not going to come back and live in your basement and they're going to be self-sufficient, is that what you're looking for? Yeah, that's different than said I want a big house. And we don't have those types of discussions. So values are critical. Then it's money temperament. This is what you do for a living. You help people understand. I call it money temperament to wrap all the complex stuff in a couple of very, very easy terms. It's how you think and feel about money naturally. And it's unique to you. And there's no judging. I don't care if you're a spender or saver, but you should know what it is. Then you need to figure out how you process information. I call this money knowledge. Money knowledge is not technical knowledge. It's knowing that I'm a visual learner, that I want to see pictures. I know I'm an auditory person. I want to hear it. I want to touch it. Because financial products are written by people that, that like doing things that other people don't like to do, which is like, like you know, figuring out the math behind a product and, and everything that goes along with it. So you should demand that, that whatever financial you plan you have supports your basic values. Because if you don't achieve those values, that's going to cause emotional angst. It should reflect how you naturally think and feel with money. That means if you are naturally a spender, then you need to have a program that's going to make it easy to save and tough, tough to spend. But you could be a dysfunctional saver also just playing cheap and not feeding your kids. So we need to have a different strategy. Yeah. Then the strategy has to support, has to be based on your values, how you think and feel about money to move forward, to give you what you're looking for. Then you bring in the product and service. But in our culture, it's usually we hit you right between the eyes, between the products and services. I fan you a couple of brochures, hand them to you. You talk about these over the weekend. I'll give you a call. Tell me the one you want. That's different than what I just explained. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you, you know you, you you know you you're you're speaking to the choir as far as <laughs> as I'm concerned as as far as I'm concerned, and this is the right approach. But also, you know, I just sort of want to get across for the um, for our listeners. You now, you're you're also you know you're an evangelist in here, Ted. You're 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 a risk taker. Mm -hmm. And how does your risk taking play out in all of this? Well, my wife keeps a log of all my dumb decisions, many of which had money involved. <laughs> but I put it in perspective. My concept of risk, if I feel passionate about where we're going, and, and this is a blind spot I have. I am self, my self-awareness is I think it's going to be okay. I'm inherently overconfident. And the definition of a, parent, a pioneer is somebody who's dead on the side of the road with arrows on the front and the back. You know, uh, and nobody knows your name. So I, I have to be very careful with that. My scores are off the top on that. Yeah. And, and I have to be very aware of the fact that I get going when I'm passionate and I can roll people up and I can scare the crap out of them. You know, that is a, that is a technical term. So often I've always built teams around me with people that counter my behavior. 
Uh, that's why Jeff and I work so well. We're on opposite ends yeah. of, of the scale and, and I can push him forward, but he can also hold me back. So the synergy is such, we've got a very, very mature functioning team that is doing great things. Where I was out there by myself, I'd just be cutting trees and somebody like Jeff would have to come back and say, you're in the wrong freaking forest. Okay, that's, that's the way I'm wired. I understand that and I understood it probably when I made some, some business decisions a few years back that I just went in and I just thought I'd overcome it and be okay. And I think we're still writing checks on that decision. But the point being is, I think I know who I am. I think I know my strengths and weaknesses and I know what I'm passionate about. I also know that if we're gonna affect true change, it has to happen with a group of like-minded people like you and me and Jeff and whatever that yeah. you know we're heading in the right direction. And we've got to have this unique ability to filter out the static and the naysayers because they will come along. Uh, we're going through a drill right now with the COVID and there's a bias which is called uh, hindsight bias and confirmation bias. Those two things are alive and well right now. I was eviscerated at the top of the COVID when I said, we're going to look back at this thing. And we're, 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 you know, at the time I said, we don't really know what, how, where this came from. We don't know how it happened. We don't know what the outcome and people thought I was nuts. And we're going through it today. They're second guessing every element of this thing. Confirmation bias. I, I look at people I know and respect who are just like me to validate my opinion. The worst animal in the world is the internet to get confirmation on where you're heading in the right direction. And then hindsight bias is, is, is basically, I'm looking at the background, I'm looking backwards to get a correlation, I'm gonna superpose it forward and I know exactly what's gonna happen. Well, how's that working out? Not too good. <laughs> no, but I think the, the, the thing I've taken away from today, Ted, as we wrap up is, is the simplification message. Yes. You know, is simplifying the mastery of money and mastery, you know, and taking that further, the mastery of money behavior. Yes. That's really the, the thing that you can do and get up on the pulpit and really help us with, you know, very passionately with the stories that, you, that you've got, you know, right back from when you're 18 years old. But I, but I think is demystifying something that's extreme, that many find mysterious and don't really understand, you know, which in some ways is incredibly simple. You know, we're dealing with the oh, energy yeah. of money, but the, your, your gift is being able to uh, go out there to lots of places and simplify yeah. that message. Yeah. And I, 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 the now, some of my most successful clients as a financial advisor were traditionally not educated, should not have been successful. And the same thing in the Marine Corps. And they became wonderful performers and absolutely magnificent people. And we called them sergeant majors. We called them owners of, of HVAC and cooling systems uh, companies and small electrician shops and plumbers and entrepreneurs who are doing a lot of things we're talking about, but they've never really had terms for it. So I guess what I'm trying to make people understand is discover your money temperament, manage your behavior, then your money baseline who you are from a behavioral perspective. And we're not judging, it does not matter, but you need to understand what it is. Now, if you're an outlier, which means you're probably got clinical issues, I can't help you and I wouldn't try. But most people don't, don't fall into that. You're following the conventional wisdom and you should know by now that if you're going someplace, it's a shopping mall and it's got the sign on that says Galleria on the top and everything is designer brand, you're gonna pay a premium to shop there. Why are you surprised? Because you're human. Yep. Yep. So Ted, as we wrap up, have you got any other tips for, for, for the audience? Anything else that you'd like them to, to read, listen to, well, do, I mean, not do? Just something really quick. Well, visit me at tedmcclyman.com if you want to know more about me and the things I'm doing. I've got a blog there. You can read about my stuff. But yeah. we need to come together and start realizing that what you and I are talking about, which is behavior, we need to move to behavioral financial wellness. That's the key for the next generation. Yeah, I absolutely ag agree with that. And it's got to have behavior in it. Yep. You can't, it's not just it's, it's missing something if it's just financial wellness. Yeah, that doesn't mean a thing. Okay. 
Well, thank you, Ted. It's been great spending time with you today. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Anytime. <laughs>